early, but now I'm uh, now we're all together, and I'm, I've really been looking forward to it. I'm Richard Dillman, and I'm part of the group, the Maritime Radio Historical Society, that has been lucky enough to restore to full operation uh, Morse Code Coast Station uh, KPH, and the um, presentation is including a, a lot of photos um, as well as a narration for me to kind of explain the photos and we um, there are actually two parts to the station there is the part that we're going to be talking about this evening which is the uh, ship to shore morse code telegraphy but the other part which is in its own way even even more impressive is what the two sites the transmit site in Bolinas and the one uh, in Marshall at the time were established as in 1914 as Trans-Pacific point-to-point operations. Well, there's a presentation on that as well. But tonight we're going to be talking about the uh, Morse code ship to shore telegraphy. So the Maritime Radio Historical Society is a nonprofit organization and we work with the Point Reyes National Seashore because both sites are on the seashore property. That's part of the National Park Service. And we are still amazed to this day uh, why 20 and more years ago when we made our presentation to the Park Service that this station was worthy of restoration and, and, and we were the guys to do it, that somehow they had the vision and the trust to say, yeah, go ahead. And, uh, and it's been through three park administrations now that we've had that kind of support. Without that, of course, nothing would have happened. Well, um, let's get rolling because there's a lot to get to. Um, Mr. Marconi here uh, was a, a real mover, as we know, in the radio business. And we also know there were a lot of other people who were working in the field, a lot of luminaries that, whose names we all understand and they all know, and they all did great work. Marconi was the one, I think it's fair to say, to actually put a lot of that together, a lot of those inventions and techniques together in a system that could actually make money. And his, his idea was the intercontinental transoceanic communications, the point to point that we talked about earlier. And, but we're, we're gonna talk about tonight is the ship to shore operations using Morse code. So he started out his work on his father's estate in Bologna in Italy and he was getting more and more range and, and, and experimenting and trying this and trying that and you know in the, in the best tradition that, that we all use. And, and he, he wasn't an engineer, he wasn't a scientist and that's good because all the engineers and all the scientists were telling him, hey, look, everybody knows radio waves don't go over the horizon. So why are you messing with this stuff? But he knew, I mean, he, once he got out to a hundred miles or so, he just knew that that just wasn't the case. He, he was on to something and he said, well, a hundred miles, why, why not a thousand? Why not multi-thousands of miles? Now his father thought that he, 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 he didn't understand it. His father did not support him. That's why I say, what's the matter for you? You know, a nice Italian boy, you could drive a truck and here you are, you're, you're messing with this, with this stuff and, and it's not gonna go anywhere. But luckily, his mother, who, as you can see, was a formidable figure, uh, rare in those days, she had her independent fortune. She's uh, an heir, was an heir of the Jameson whiskey fortune. She's an Irish lady. And so she was able to say, Guglielmo, hey, my son, I love you so much. Here's my credit card. You go down to HRO, you get whatever you want, and we, you know, you, you, have, you, you play. Well, of course, there was no HRO, there was no radio, there was no nothing. He was inventing it uh, pretty much on the fly by himself. But, you know, he never forgot his, his father's failure to support him to the extent that he never attended his father's funeral. Now, there's a guy who knows how to hold a grudge. Much respect. <laughs> well, uh, jumping ahead a bit, uh, it had been established that the uh, that radio wireless was a, a viable going concern. You can make money with it. Um, there was a station in San Francisco under Uni owned by United Wireless. United Wireless uh, went bankrupt. The American Marconi Telegraph Company acquired the station. That's how the station 
came into their possession, and it was located here in the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, thus the call sign PH. Now, back in those days, there were no radio regulations, and I can just picture these two guys up in the attic with this little radio station. Okay, we've got it fixed. Seems to be working. What's our call letters? Well, we're in the Palace Hotel. Let's be PH. Okay, fine. Works for me. Off you go. PH is the call sign. And here's the only photograph we've been able to find of the interior of PH. And this was 1905, by the way. And over on the left, uh, we can recognize the transmitter panel. Uh, and right next to that with the wires coming down, that's the uh, transmit receive switch. Uh, I mean, on the right of the transmitter panel. And over on the left, the receiver, you can see the headphones on the table there. Um, a, a crystal detector or maybe carborundum detector all passive, no amplification. It's amazing the work that they did with the, uh, with the equipment that, as we look back on it, uh, is rudimentary to the point we're amazed that it even worked, but it worked and it worked well for them. Well, 1906 was not a good year for San Francisco. The city burned down along with the Palace Hotel and little PH went along with it. So lasted for maybe a year at the Palace Hotel. Well, after the fire, uh, the station was reestablished in San Francisco at a location on Green Street. And here you see it. And I, we were wondering and wondering for years, you know, where was it? Where, well, somebody gave me this postcard and I said, holy mackerel, there it is. Here's this little house up on the, up on the hill overlooking the bay. And since then, we've gotten several more photos. And here it is over in the distance and then close up we actually see the little shack and, you know, amazing. Well, that did, that was, this is about 19, maybe 1907, certainly 1908. This was an operation there, but even then, you see it's somewhat of a residential neighborhood and, and they're having the same problems that ham radio guys have had forever. Because, I mean, there's no television, there's no radio, but there's bed springs and there's telephones and there's toasters. And they're coming in like gangbusters on the bed springs. And, of course, they're using a, a, a rotary. We believe it could have been a straight gap. We're not sure. But either way, it's making a ton of audio noise. And the neighbors are finally saying, look, it's enough already. You guys, we can't have this. You guys got to go. Uh, and so they moved then, and oh, here's a, a look at it from the other direction over that cliff. So there really wasn't much to it from our point of view, but this is what, this is, you know, this is typical for a station of that type at that time. And around that time, this is now 1912, jumping ahead to 1912, of course, with the Titanic disaster, and that really brought ship to shore wireless and Marconi into the notice of the public. And everybody wanted to know who was saved, who wasn't. I think a, probably a lot of us have read a, a lot of the history of this disaster and the role that radio played in it. And one of the things that came out of that disaster was changes in the shipping regulations. For example, uh, telling the ship owners, well, you, how about you have enough lifeboats for everybody? What do you think about that? And of course, the ship owners notoriously cheap saying, no, no, we can't. No, you're going to have enough lifeboats for everybody. And then on the radio end of it, they said, okay, there's going to be a single frequency, or as they then refer to it as wavelength, 600 meters, 500 kilocycles, that everybody's going to listen to all the time. And they were already, that was already a common frequency. That's what MGY, the uh, station on board the Titanic, was using. So we, we're going to enshrine this now as a regulation. Everybody listens to that all the time. That's not only the communications frequency, the calling frequency, but it's the distress frequency. So that was great, except, of course, it's a cacophony of signals. So they said, OK, this is good, but not good enough. We're going to establish some time limitations. And here is the clock that is um, mandated was mandated right up until 1999 to be in all radio rooms and it has these wedges uh, on the 45 minute and the 15 minute period that's the silent period you probably all know this silent period on 500 kc so during those three minutes every ship every aircraft every every coast station has to maintain radio silence during that time to listen for the weak little sos that that the guy in a lifeboat might be trying to crank out during that period 
And then there's uh, these markings, and these are the auto alarm signals. So here you are, you're sinking, the deck is listing at 45 degrees, the water's up to your ankles, and you want to send an SOS, but before that, you want to send your auto alarm signal. So that's four seconds down, one second up, four seconds down, one second up, right around the clock. And you see that these clocks all had sweep second hands for that purpose. Man, that must have been the longest minute in anybody's life trying to send those, those signals. But if you could manage that, the auto alarm receivers that were maintaining a watch on the ships and the shore stations when the radio officers were off duty, they would automatically ring bells and light, light lights and the radio officer would actually have to come to the radio room and listen uh, before he could manually shut off the, uh, the alarm. So this was a wonderful system, saved many, many lives over the years. Well, they moved away from uh, Russian Hill, as we were saying, and here they moved to a site. This is the new KPH on a site in, uh, in Daly City, uh, above Daly City, called Hillcrest. And here in the background, you see the Pacific Ocean and you see Lake Merced. Keep this in mind, it will become important later. So here's where, here's where they were, in, and, and you see quite a bit bigger than the earlier one. And here it is looking from the other direction, and you see they, they had to tie the thing down to the cliff so it wouldn't get blown off in these Pacific winds. And believe me, I'm up here on Inverness Ridge, and it feels like uh, this house is going to blow away sometime. So I, I really know what, what it feels like there. And, and you see the antenna lead in. Uh, going up and they actually had two masts here. So this is going up to the center of the antenna between the two masts. And here's what it looked like in the early days. It's, it's hard to make too much out of this photo, but this is the first um, generation of KPH. It had achieved, uh, acquired the K, and as we all know, the international prefixes were decided for the different countries. K, one of the prefixes for the United States. So PH became KPH. And I believe that was in 1912. And that's what it looked like in the first generation. But here's what it looked like. I picked up this uh, negative. I actually got the negative at the Foothill Swap Meet. You remember there, those up in Northern California will remember it was one of the best swap meets going. And here's what the interior looked like. And as you see this in 1919. So now we have the Marconi 106 receiver here. And here's what it looked like in the, in the catalog. And it's really a, a tuner rather than what we would think of as a receiver. And you see between the rightmost bottom dial and the middle dial, that's the crystal detector there. Uh, but outboard, you had an audio amplifier. And that little thing in the middle, it's, it's actually a tube. I mean, it's a cylind cylinder, cylindrical tube with just wires sticking out. I have one of them that uh, was, was a one stage of audio amplification. So you had that. And then, uh, oh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody can see the picture well enough, probably not, but this is a big deal. Anybody, all right, this is, a, this is the grip of a pistol that's in a holster nailed to the side of the operating table. So we said, well, what, you know, what is up with that? I mean, if somebody comes to complain for a radiogram, you say, all right, you know, bam, I'll take that. <laughs> well, there's a guy who wrote a book, uh, Captain Johnstone, who was here as, as well as every place else in the Bay Area. He said, no, this is the pistol that we use for our little black and white friends, by which he means the skunks. Now, it seems to me the last thing you want to do <laughs> with a skunk is, uh, is shoot it. But anyway, that's what he said. Well, there's some other things to notice here. And these photos, you know, I've had this one for a long time, and I've had some others that we're going to see in a minute for a less long time, but still thought I knew them very well. But here I'm looking at this knife switch here. Now, what's, what's up with this? Why would that be here? Because you also see up at the ceiling another knife switch. So what's going on here? Well, we were lucky enough to get photos of the other side of that wall, just behind that wall. And I'm looking and looking. And finally, it, it's, it comes, sort of comes into focus. I say, what have I actually got here? There's actually two transmitters here. And here is the motor driving the rotary gap for a small transmitter. And down here, you have the sort of laden jar type condensers for it. And here is the power switch to turn the motor on and off. And then 
over on this side, you've got the big transmitter with the oscillation coils and the condensers down here. So you've got two transmitters. I finally realized we're looking at the primary and the backup transmitters. And now this makes sense. This is the knife switch that puts the little backup rotary online. So you, you know, you throw that, the big transmitter goes off the line for whatever reason, you got to keep going. Revenue for the company that ships out there calling, you got to work them. So bam, you throw that knife switch and you're back in business, lower power, but you're on the air. And here's the knife switch that takes the uh, primary uh, transmitter on and off the air. And this, and I'm going out on a limb here because the photo is, uh, there's so little resolution there, but I do believe since we don't see the, the rotary gap in the picture showing the other side of this wall, I do believe that the, uh, which is, was very common, that the rotary is on the drive shaft of the motor generator. This is all stuff driven by motor generators. Anyway, that's my guess. And so that's what we're looking at here. And this is what it looked like from down below. Here you see the two masts. Um, okay, now back to the outside of the shack and Lake Merced here. So a colleague and I decide we're going to see if we can find this. This is like 15 years ago now. So we, we go up, we find Hillcrest, we get up there, and what's there, of course, a, a gated community with a spectacular view of the ocean. And we're kind of disheartened, but we go bushwhacking along the north side of the ridge, and here we find this is the place. This is sacred ground to us. This is where that shack was. You see the pilings for it, and you see Lake Merced in the background. It was very thrilling uh, to actually stand at the location where this, where KPH Hillcrest once stood. Well, in 1920, the station moved up here to Marin to the already existing site of the Marconi Point to Point station. Now, we already know the transmitters were in Bolinas, and here's what the receive site looked like in Marshall which is north of here along Tomales Bay. And you see center, the big building there, that's the hotel. That wasn't for the public. Uh, that was for the operators at the station. Uh, to the right, you see the powerhouse. They didn't generate power at Bolinas. They brought in power from two separate substations, big cost savings for them. But they did generate power at the receive site, uh, much less load for the receivers, of course, than for the transmitters. So that made economic sense. And up on the ridge, you see the 300 foot towers, there's seven of them uh, marching along the ridge line, aligned directly out at Hawaii. And over on the left, just behind that tower is one of the two cottages. Same thing down at Bolinas. This is where the station manager, he had a cottage and the chief engineer had his own cottage. And off to the left, uh, beyond our field of view here was the actual receiving room, um, which we have almost no information. Uh, I, I, the building still exists. I've been through I've been through it from attic to basement. I've been through every one of these buildings from attic to basement. And in the receive room, we were just not able, it, it's gone through so many iterations, we were not able to really get any valuable information from that exploration. Well, here's what the guys, here's the two operating positions at KPH and Marshall. And as you see, there's so few cues here to try and match up with an existing building today. I, I, ju I, just, I just couldn't locate it. I, we don't even know what building it was in. But anyway, here they are. And I believe they are dressed up for the uh, photographer. I don't believe they, maybe they did. I don't know, maybe they wore a suit and tie every day, but I doubt it. What I do know is they're we wearing their head, head crusher Western Electric Model 509 headphones. And I have several of these. And I can tell you that after an hour or so, they feel like they're trying to meet each other in the, in the middle of your head. These are not comfortable headphones. And they're sitting in front of the um, IP501 receivers. And the tuner is right behind the guy's hand who's holding the pencil. And then off to the right is two stages of audio amplification. And here is a landline telegraph sounder. And I mentioned that because all of the stations, the transmit station, the receive station, and the central radio office in San Francisco were all linked up by landline telegraph. And as most of us probably know, the Morse code being used on the landline and that being used over the air are two different Morse codes, the American Morse and the, and the international or continental code that we know. So these guys had to be uh, bilingual 
in in Morse, and they all were, and they were all great at it. Well, we got this IP501A eventually, and this one is almost identical to the one that was used um, that we saw in the picture, except it has this two stages of amplification built into the cabinet. And this thing is just pristine. I mean, it was it, we were so lucky to get it, and it was never, obviously never on a ship. There's no no sense of corrosion in it or anything. Um, the rightmost dial of the two silver dials is actually calibrated in wavelength. So here we are trying to get this thing going and it's all powered up and you know, we're, we, we're full of ourselves. Yeah, we know about this. It's a regenerative. Yeah, okay. I mean, we, we understand this stuff. No, you know, no problem. Big problem. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot going on here that we really had to get our mind around. But the funniest part was we have it out of the case. And, and there's one guy standing behind and he's looking at the tuning condenser, the one connected to the, to the calibrated dial. And the guy in the front who's moving the dial says, well, I, you know, I've, I've got it, I've got it uh, fully meshed. So it's at the, um, or he says, I've, I've got it at, at the high frequency end of the dial, the, the short wavelength end of the dial. And the guy in the back says, well, you can't, the capacitor, the condenser is fully meshed. So, well, I'm telling you. And he says, no, I'm telling you. And, you know, pretty much there getting hot under the collar. And we finally realized that sometime, who knows when, 1936 or who knows, somebody had taken this apart and then put the calibrated dial back 180 degrees wrong. So we finally sorted that out. But this thing is such a beauty and it works so well and we liked it so much, we even commissioned this table for it to sit on. So you'll, you'll see this when you come up and, and visit us. Now here's KPH still up at Marshall. Here's the second iteration. And now you see the IP501s are up on the top shelf and then the uh, the mills and all the rest of it, the bugs and everything uh, down on the lower shelf. And this was operating uh, two bands, the medium freak band, uh, 500 centered uh, at 500 KC and below below in frequency. And then the long longer wave band, which still exists. I mean, if we could put up an antenna for the 136 KC band, uh, we'd be on it. <laughs> In fact, the KPH license uh, is authorized for 120, 126 KC. It's still there, still in part 80, still in the rules. Here is the log of KPH, December 7th, 1941. And it's just chilling. I mean, I still get goosebumps when I read it. And it and and you can just picture these guys. Uh, here they are. It's a nice Sunday afternoon um, in California, just like it was in Hawaii. And it's a lazy day. Not much, is, not much is going on. In fact, in the log, the guy notes just super quiet, nothing going on. But then this stuff starts to come in. Air raid Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. Execute war plan against Japan. Can you imagine? what these guys must have felt. Um, well, we had a copy of this log for a long time, but several years ago, I got a call from the daughter of Frank Geisel, Frank Geisel being the most famous station manager at KPH and his daughter Gloria got me, gave me a call, said, can you come and see me? I said, of course. And uh, so off I go and I get there and she hands me the original log, the actual one that she had kept. And you imagine what a feeling that was to actually have it handed into, into my hands and what a, what a responsibility I felt. So I immediately took it to the archive office of the park. Can you imagine if I had this in my basement in a cardboard box and the pipe breaks and it's gone, you know, couldn't have that happen. So the archivists uh, have it in safe museum storage and then they made a really excellent copy of it for us that we have on hand to show visitors. So World War II and during that time, the, the station was shut down, the ship to shore was shut down just like all the others in the country. The point to point, of course, exploded as the Imperial Japanese Navy ran rampant across the Pacific. You can imagine how important these circuits became but as one by one, uh, the, the transmitters went off the air as the uh, Japanese forces took them over. So for the duration, KPH was off the air. Uh, and here is the point-to-point -point receiving station at Point Reyes. Built in 1930, it was for 
the point-to-point -point HF. When, once HF short wave was discovered, it was, uh, as, as we know, uh, what we would call today a disruptive technology, long wave, which everybody thought you needed the longest possible wavelengths and the most power you could manage. Short wave just upended all of that. And when RCA decided to invest in short wave, because that's obviously the way things were going, they built this receive building in Point Reyes. And after the war, RCA said to Frank Geisel, Frank, get KPH back on the air and get it in this little room in the front of the receive site at Point Ray. So once again, as to the up until the very last day, the ship to shore guys were always the poor cousin of the point to point operation, always getting the hand me down equipment, the leftover antennas, all the rest of it. But but they were our heroes and they're the ones who were standing on the very last day. Well, they did establish uh, the station there and they traveled around in a Willie's utility wagon for the uh, Radio Marine Corporation of America. Well, I just happened to have a Willie's utility wagon. And so of course we lettered it for the Radio Marine Corporation of America. Uh, mine is a four wheel drive so we and has a winch on it. So we actually use it out in the antenna fields for antenna work. And the guy standing next to me is Tom Horsfall, uh, my co-founder of the Maritime Radio Historical Society. So we get a big kick out of that. Well, here's the inside of KPH post-war uh, up at Point Reyes. And you see just two positions. And by the way, you see the red wedges on the clock up there, but you also see the, uh, the pinups, which of course you have to have for any functioning ship to shore radio station. And you see here over on this uh, CR-91, this RCA receiver, notice around the main tuning dial, you can see these little white things. Well, what they would do, um, since, since the tuning accuracy, you mean those of us who like old receivers, we know, okay, they're great, but you, you know, get within 5KC, you're doing good. So they would uh, take some tape and mark the calling and working frequencies around the dial. So the ship would call on a calling frequency, you'd go up and work them on a working frequency, you could spin the dial and know exactly where you needed to get to. And over on the one that's under the clock, you can see this little square of cardboard under the dial. So that, that's how they did it. And here is the uh, so-called the wheel, a loop of uh, punch paper tape that sends out the repeating message, the wheel saying, this is KPH, we're listening on these channels, give us a call, give us a call, give us a call. So that's going all the time whenever you're not working a ship so they can find you on the dial and decide whether, what's the better frequency for the ocean I'm in, eight megs, six megs, 12 megs, what I'm, you know, what's, what's the best? And then they would call you on the corresponding frequency in that band. But when nobody was being worked, you put that on there to mark your spot on the dial. And here is a 2B teletype machine, which I didn't know. I, I'm not a teletype expert. I mean, I can spot a model 15, of course, but a model 28, but this is how to have the teletype aficionado say, no, that's a 2B, strip printer and it um as you see the little strips there up above it this they're gonna say look first of all you'll never find one if you find one you'll never make it work if you make it work you'll never find the tape that goes in it if you find the tape that goes in it it'll just be a gelatinous mass because it's got adhesive on the back and after 70 years it's just going to be a useless glob well we found it we found the tape we have it working and it is functional in the uh, in the receive room you come and see it so you type out the incoming messages are type out on these strips and then you paste it down on what's called the gumming table onto a message blank and as fun as it was to have this piece of equipment functional and working and there the real purpose is that it opened up a whole area of knowledge. Why was this thing here in the first place? And in Frank Geisel's reports, he was always saying, well, the, the Western Union line is down again. What's, why is there a Western Union line? Well, looking back, it's obvious that it's not an RCA office in, in every town, far from it, but there is a Western Union office. So you could go in to any Western Union office, file your radiogram for a ship, and if it was a ship in the Pacific Ocean, it would print out on this strip printer at KPH, paste it down on the message blank and put in the message rack for delivery. So it was, uh, it was very educational. It put another peg in place. Well, after the um, receivers upstairs, the point to point receivers upstairs converted to AC, the room in the back, which was the battery room 
and was the, uh, the motor generator room, that became vacant. So KPH moved back there where it is today. And here's some pictures of what it looked like. And here you see what the wheel looked like then. And look at all those pulleys. And this was because you punch paper tape for things like the weather and, uh, and press reports and so forth. Um, on 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 a Kleinschmidt on a Klein machine. So here is the uh, here, here's the, the both the wheel and the outgoing paper tape, and here's the Kleinschmidt. And this is two level Wheatstone code. Well, here is the wheel. We find that we recovered it. We still have it. It looks much better. <laughs> looks much better now. It's actually been almost completely restored. That little fiber gear, sadly, is broken, and we haven't figured out a way to reproduce it. Other than that, it's ready to go. And here's the Klein, which I finally found. I found it actually at the, at the uh, Foothill Swap Meet. And now we have a bunch of them. So I started using it, it's restored, it's working. And I was telling the, uh, the old timer, I said, guys, you know, I'm punching tape on the Klein. And, oh, that's good, good on you, good man. So yeah, but you know, I mean, what do you, I don't know what to do. So if you make a mistake, there's no way, I mean, what did you do when you made a mistake? Because, you know, even when you're punching teletype, auto teletype, there's a way to correct for your mistakes. But I said, what did you guys do? And there's this silence, you know, they're looking at me like, you dumb. <laughs> he said, well, we didn't make mistakes. That was our solution. That's how we did it. And, oh, okay, thank you very much, you know, <laughs> kind of hang my head. Um, well, here is now the interior of the station, and you start to see things are starting to modernize a little bit. This is Les Berger at one of the operating positions. And you notice for the weight on his bug here, he's using a cable clamp. And and he's sending with his right hand and writing with his left hand. This confused the park service enough that they originally printed the, the picture backwards. But of course, this is what you try to train yourself to do because you got to keep it going, keep it going. Revenue for the company, next ship, next ship. This is not like ham radio, money, it's money. Time is money. There's no chatting, next ship, next ship. I mean, these guys would work 50, 60, 70, 80 ships in their eight hour shift, just banging away. Very stressful job, but every one of them that I've met has said, Richard, you know, I'd come back tomorrow. I loved that job. It was just the greatest. And you see over here on the uh, Collins 51 J4, which uh, Dennis and many others will recognize, general coverage version. And you still see the markings, see the little tape markings on the dial there. Here's the calling frequency, here's the, here's the, uh, the working frequency. And also, I hate to keep putting the spotlight on Dennis, but I noticed that you had a, a Drake 2B up on the shelf there. Well, what would this ham receiver be doing at a commercial coast station. What's the story here? It's a puzzlement. Well, finally, we found out these are used as keying monitors. Now, in the commercial service, it's always duplex. You're not on the same frequency like we are in ham radio. It's always duplex. And you want to be able to hear your own keying. Now, there is a side tone built into the console. Nobody likes it. I don't like it. I don't use it. You want to hear your keying over the air. So as you know, with the 2B, you can put in different crystals to cover different bands. So they modified the crystals so it was covering the commercial bands. So you could tune to your own signal coming out of Bolinas and have that going into your earphones. So you could have a, a side tone there. And here's a, another position, uh, CR91 on the lower left and a beautiful HRO5 uh, above that. But here, a BC453. What the heck is up with the BC-453? The command sets, we remember them. I see some guys here with gray beards like me. Remember when there were so many command set receivers around, you were using them to prop open doors and it was thought we would never end. But <laughs> so the BC-453, why is it there? I don't know. Well, one of the most amazing things and, and more most heartfelt and wonderful things are when some of the stuff that went away comes back. So here's this guy whose father worked here. And I know him, I see him around town. He, you know, I'm the radio guy in town. So that's there. he says, you know, I got this thing and I think you should have it. Okay, good, well, bring it over. Well, he brings it over and there it is. It's been on this, you know, it got, it was obsolete. They took it on, it was heading, it was heading for the dumpster. He intercepted it. It spent uh, God knows how many decades on the shelf in his garage. And here's the very receiver that we see in that picture. And we see 426, 
the calling for the working frequency, the medium frequency, uh, medium frequency working frequency for KPH. And there it is. So we have it back on the shelf. The, sorry, guys, all my fault. Uh, Bill Maloney, as I was saying, I, I guess <laughs> this is punishment for me saying I thought I was good on the Morse code key. And uh, maybe I'm passable, but then I started working with the folks who did it for a living. And I realized I had much to learn. And all those people who did it for a living said, yeah, I guess I'm okay on the Morse code key, but you know the guy who is really the best, Bill Maloney. And here he is, Bill. Now he is a Quaker. He's passed away, was a Quaker. So he could have sat out World War II honorably and legally, he did not. He became a radio officer in the Merchant Marine during the war. And those of us who study World War II know what the casualty rate in the Merch was during the war. Torpedo twice came back to KPH to be one of the best and most beloved operators at the station. But here's the thing we're gonna talk about today is this receiver. This is a Marconi Atalanta receiver. And you see it's got that little tag on it there. This becomes important. When we got there, a lot of things were missing among them, this receiver. Well, I was stumbling around in the dark, dimly lit basement of an undisclosed location near here. And here it is, I found it. I mean, I took a picture with my flash, but it was a basically a dark space. Found the original receiver and we can tell because here's that tag. So I took it. It was at night, I didn't steal it, but I did take it. <laughs> so it has come back home. And the same thing with transmitter BL11. This is the backup on uh, 500 KC, 600 meters. You had to be uh, operational at all times on that. And here is uh, Ivan Nielsen, one of the great uh, technicians at the station in front of BL11. When we got there, BL11 was gone. Here it is in that same basement, found it, took it. It's now being restored. And one of the best things is something that the casual observer might want to clean this off, but no, this is actual radio marine important, as we say, um, historic fabric. It shows on 426 and 500 KC what you should expect in the way of antenna current when the thing is properly tuned up. Well, back to the operating room in the, uh, this looks like, well, this has got to be in the 60s because you notice there's an HRO 500. The, uh, the first solid state receiver at the station. Uh, we have three or four of them from the station. One of them has been restored and operational uh, for which we are enormously grateful. The guy who did it took a couple of years to do it and wouldn't take a penny for the job. Indebted, indebted to him for that. Here's Warren Reese. This is the guy who had uh, the 30K, 30K5 it was, Dennis, that he had stuck between two other transmitters. And he's standing in front of the Henry five kilowatt uh, transmitters that replaced a lot of the original RCA transmitters that were at uh, Bolinas. Not a lot, luckily replaced only two. So those two were lost, but all the others were abandoned in place, luckily for us, because then we had material to work on to restore them. And here's Warren in one of the publicity photos and of course a tremendously good Morse code operator and a, and a mentor to many of us. By that time you see that the messages instead of being typed on a mill uh, went into an uh, electronic database, which a lot of guys resisted until they tried it and then said, okay, this is pretty good, I'll go for this. Here's the last message, it's still existing on a printer in our teletype room on uh, June 30th. 1997, all the staff at Bolinas Radio KPH to our colleagues ashore and at sea. This announcement marks the end of broadcasting from our locations at Bolinas and Point Reyes after 85 years of service. We wish you fair winds and following seas. 73, 88, because Denise Stoops was an operator. In fact, by that time, there were two female operators at the station. And there it rested. The station remained abandoned. And for those of you who have done any kind of radio archaeology, you know what happens to abandoned stations. They get vandalized and trashed and spray painted and everything else. And I just could not face that. I could not return to that station and face that. Well, the reason the station went off the air is that the license was purchased by the competing station, KFS. And here is their Half Moon Bay operating station. Uh, here is Paul Zell, ACE Morse operator. And this is July 12th, 
1999, the last day of Morse, and we were all there. Denise was there dressed like she was at a funeral, all in black. And here's guys, I'm looking around the room, these guys, these grizzled old buzzards, guys who you, you know, the guys you walk into a bar room and there's a guy down the end, just this old, you know, kind of grizzled guy, you, you know, you just don't mess with that guy. And there was a lot of them in the room. And these, of course, are seagoing radio officers who have seen everything, been everywhere, been on every ocean. And they're weeping. Me too. It's their life ending, not literally, but their, their profession, their, what, what defined them is ending. So the last messages are gonna be sent. And here's, here's Paul and here's Ray Smith, the senior Morse operator, Jack Martini, the last manager of KPH. And now it comes time to send the last messages, the end. And they even let me send one of the messages. So I step up to the key, and then I realize standing behind me are the best Morse operators in the world. No pressure, Richard, just don't screw it up. <laughs> and well, uh, they very kindly gave me a round of applause afterwards, so I guess I didn't make too much of a fool of myself, but I was highly honored. And here is uh, one of the messages that uh, we sent on the proper Mackie radio uh, blank, of course. And here's Tim Gorder endorsing my license. This is when you still had, when your commercial license was still in a diploma form. And he's endorsing my license to say, yes, uh, satisfactory service on the last day of telegraphy in North America. And here on the back of the license, you see, it wasn't the last day, 12 July 2000, Jack Martini signs the license KPH back on the air. Very meaningful to me, very meaningful to me. Well, here we are back at the receive site we looked at earlier. This is where KPH now is in the back room and has been since uh, the end of World War II. And so we, uh, after this um, event down in, um, down in Half Moon Bay, the one we were just looking at where I sent those messages, Tom Horsfall and I said, this can't be, you know, we cannot have this fade away. We're gonna go, I don't care, Dillman, how, you know, how emotional you are, we're gonna go up there and see what's what. So, but that time the, uh, the station hadn't been turned over to the park yet. There was a guard on the door. We talked our way past the guard, go down the main hallway. And before we even get into the room, the CW, the Morse operating room, I start hearing static and I hear Morse code and I hear ships calling and I know the joint is closed for two years and I expected it to be trashed, but I'm hearing these sounds and we walk in to the Morse operating room and it was like they had left 20 minutes ago. Coffee cups still on the table. You see the Morse keys still on the table. The tags were put there by Jack Martini to identify what each thing was so the historians would know. And the last thing they did before they walked away and turned out the lights and locked the door was to make sure that the receivers were still on, maintaining a symbolic watch over the airwaves. And we saw that and we see that the ears in Point Reyes are still living. The voice, the transmitters in Bellinas, dark and cold, but still existing. And we said, thank you. It's just not that often that you get your life's work handed to you on a platter like that. I said, this is what we have to do. This is our work. This is what we're going to do. All we had to do was convince the National Park Service, since it's on Park Service land, that this was worth doing and we were the guys to do it. So we made this wonderful proposal, printed it up, had pictures with circles and arrows on the front and the paragraph on the back of each one saying what it was. And we slide it across the table to the senior executive, the superintendent of the park and his senior staff. And we realize he's not looking at that proposal. He's looking across the table at us. He's looking at us in the eye. And I realize he's saying, how crazy are these guys? Are they nutty enough? to stay with it over the long term, or are we gonna have problems? We're we gonna have problems with these guys. Well, somehow they had the vision and the courage to say, go ahead, and we did. Well, here's the um, transmitter gallery in Bolinas as we found it. Well, not quite as we found it because it was filthy. There was a pile of garbage going right down that center aisle, just junk and crap. So shovel, 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 get that stuff out there, get the, mat, uh, the mop out and start cleaning. 
and you see the original RCA transmitters there and then the beige Henry transmitters. So we started on the Henry transmitters first as a restoration. Now they had been abandoned in place for two years, but this place was open to the atmosphere by then. We opened it up, there's standing water in the back. Well, standing water, 6,000 volts, doesn't go well together. So we clean and clean and clean, dry and dry and dry. Okay, it looks good, Tom. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, play, you know, hit the money button. Bam, you, know, you get this literally green flame <laughs> coming out the top of these things. Good thing the park people didn't see that. But anyway, we got to the point where we could restore one of these transmitters. And I say we, but I'm really talking about the transmitter department. This is not my skill. We have the best, best folks in the world working on these transmitters. And then we turned our attention to these RCA transmitters. Now they'd been abandoned in place for 10 years. You could not move the controls. They were rusted in place. Every one of them is now restored and working. Well, that's not good enough. We decided we needed more transmitters. We went down to the transmitter site in Palo Alto, the transmitter site of KFS. After it was off the air, they said, take your pick. So we picked two press wireless 40s vintage PW15 transmitters, the best of the lot, and had them brought up to the Bolinas site and installed there. Now, these were actually on the air on the last night, on July 12th, 1999. And one of them was on one of the very frequencies that was used then. And here it is in place. Now we reverse engineered it so we can put back the original mercury vapor uh, rectifier tubes in there. And here you see it keying away. That's just amazing. What a wonderful thing to see. And here is the most complex transmitter in the site, the so-called H-set. It's an independent sideband point-to-point -point transmitter. And we said, man, this, okay, we're good at this stuff, but man, this is pretty intimidating. And they were in horrible, horrible shape. This is what you're facing when you look inside the thing. But a group of engineers from Hewlett Packard joined us and they said, look, we want a project we can really sink our teeth into. We said, okay, yeah, you do. Well, try this. How about restoring an H set? And they said, okay, we'll do it. And they did. And it took them three years and 3,000 hours to do it, but here's that same deck and what it looked like when they were done with it. And I have tons of pictures before and after pictures. You just can't believe the work that they did. Here's the inside of the transmitter that was just corroded and you think beyond help. This is what it looked like when they were getting done with it. A pair of 6166s there. And here it is being tuned up um, by one of our, one of our volunteers. And this is uh, 2013, Night of Nights 2013. And here is Cecily Muldoon. She is the superintendent of the park. She and her senior staff did us the honor of attending Night of Nights 2013. And she's gonna press the money button and put this transmitter on the air. And here you see me leaning in and you can practically see the thought bubble above my head, which says, please don't let this thing catch on fire when she presses the button. Well, of course, there was no chance of that because the restoration work was so superb. And that transmitter has just been perking away without fault since then. And like so many other things at this project, it's the only place in the world where you're gonna be able to see this thing just pounding away. Some meters bouncing. This is on 22 megs on the KPH uh, 22 meg frequency. Just amazing to see. I don't know about you guys, but I could watch that all the time. Let's see if we can get to the next slide, however. So sometimes we can take the show on the road. This is up, you will recognize the hotel at the uh, Marconi Receive site in Marshall. And here's one of the two cottages. Now we were able, we, have, we built these remote control consoles here. So we can control the transmitters in Bolinas from wherever there's a phone line. And so we had uh, both amateur K6, KPH and uh, KPH itself on the air from the actual location where it once was. And that was, that was thrilling to us. We were barred from going to the uh, sites during the COVID-19 shutdown. And Dennis, you may recognize, I don't know if you do, but this is a former VOA receive site in uh, Rio Vista 
that became the new KPH transmit site after KFS took over. So the license already existed for this spot for these KPH frequencies. So we were able to get in there with the permission of the owner and get some of the frequencies back on the air while we weren't able to get into the Bolinas and Point Reyes sites. And there's one of the antennas is this uh, log periodic, which we swung around. It was pointed um, somewhere around to the south for some reason. And um, we swung it around so it's pointing to the east. So that's, uh, that's, I think we use that primarily on 12 megs. So we were able to at least stay alive during that period. Um, not all the frequencies, not full power, but we were on the air. We were keeping the traditions going. We were staying alive. Meanwhile, back in Bolinas, it was the opportunity to do a ton of maintenance of antenna restoration and repair, uh, fixing these H frames, getting heavy equipment in there, replacing the, uh, the ground anchors, just doing tons and tons of work. So that now when we're starting, we were able to be back for night of nights at the Bolinas site and the Point Ray site. And we hope that means we're gonna be able to get back on Saturdays like we used to be. But now we've got a lot more antennas to use. So everything can be back on the air, including uh, teletype service. Uh, so we're hoping. So we'll be back as we were, um, sign inviting people to come in, join us. And this is what it looks like in the operating room now. Five operators, I'm, I'm the fifth standing up on the ladder taking the picture. Uh, working ships, Morse bathing in the music of Morse on all these channels, banging away, working ships, working amateur stations, just the best there is. And we, we certainly hope that uh, when, when we're able to get back to normal, that as many folks among the group here as possible can join us. Uh, it's just the best. Uh, we'll give you the A tour, absolutely. So sorry, it took a little longer with my internet failures here, but I do appreciate your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You did a great job. We can edit out all that other stuff. That's not a problem. Okay. Uh, are there, I'm going to take you and uh, take out the spotlight there so we can see who's talking. And uh, there's some questions here. Barry, what we got in the chat? Nothing right now. Looking right now. Okay, hands up. Looks like Dennis has got his hand up, and so does Larry. Let's take Larry first. Yeah, I've been wondering that. Uh, you said during World War II they shut it down. Um, didn't they use a lot of the uh, marine uh, radios for uh, basically the listening post? Yeah, that's true. Um, we um, The records that we have for the... Um, <clears throat> for the war years, as, as you might expect, are a little thin. Um, but the, as far as we can tell, the uh, Bolina site and the Point Ray site during the war were really used mainly for their intended purpose, which was trans-Pacific communication. And of course, on the, on the Morse code side, there's no more commercial shipping there. It's, it's either military shipping or, or the ship is sunk one way or the other. So, and they're all operating under radio silence. So the former commercial Morse code stations were shut down for that reason. And as, just as you say, there was tons of intercept going on all over the place. But from what we can tell, that wasn't done to a great extent at the, uh, at the Point Race site. Okay, uh, Dennis, you wanna take it? Oh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Richard. What a fabulous presentation. I just love this. Uh, you mentioned the VOA receive site. Was that was that associated with the Dixon relay? Yeah, exactly. You you know your geography there. That's right. Okay. So that was I think that was both for incoming program material and also I think to monitor the uh, VO tra VOA transmissions as well. The, actually, actually, the way I understand it, it was a backup <clears throat> because all the program material was brought in on landline through the Bell system. And the way I understand it, from the from the system down at uh, Delano where we worked, the uh, receive site is in the town of Pixley, which I love. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they never used it. They never had to. They never had to use the uh, Pixley site because the phone lines never went down. They were they were up the whole time. So, pretty remarkable system. And bless your heart for what you guys do up there. What a what a wonderful thing you do as volunteers to keep that station on the air. We love it and. Really congratulate you on a successful night of nights last Monday. That was that Thank was you, Dennis. That, that 
means a lot coming from from you guys. You know, the um, the program distribution. Those of us who are old enough uh, heard that uh, on HF. Um, at least I did, and they use the uh, diversity receivers of which we have restored one. And if we get to talk about the point to point at some day, we'll, we'll see that. But you know, the, the ones that were in this Rio Vista site were actually RACAL do, set up in diversity recession, but RACAL receivers as opposed to the RCA receivers. Right. Steve, did you have, do you want to come on? You got your hand up. Yeah, I had a question. Um, did, did Ken Jones or Globe Wireless, have they contributed anything toward your effort at all? Um, well, they, they did. Uh, uh, Ken, of course, is a consummate businessman. The story we get is that he really wasn't interested in radio. He wanted that, uh, that uh, Pacific Coast property down at the KPH receive site. But, but as you know, that evolved into uh, a global uh, SITOR teletype over radio system. Well, we never got a chance to speak to him directly, although I did send him letters of thanks and, and all the rest of it. Um, and we did, uh, we were given the privilege of, of over years obtaining a lot of historic data and uh, material hardware from, from the sites. So in that sense, uh, he definitely contributed. What we really wanted was the call sign. So we had gotten our own commercial co-station license under the call sign KSM, and that was great. We were on commercial frequencies. We were working ships. We were doing it just like it was, except it wasn't. We were not signing KPH. We were signing KSM. So I am trying and trying and trying with these guys, making all kinds of proposals, saying, look, you could do this. We could do that. It would be great. No, couldn't get anywhere. <laughs> a few years ago, I guess it's five years ago or so now, they approached me, said, look, we'd like you to activate KPH from the Bolina site. What do you think? I said, yeah, I've only been waiting 15, 20 years for that. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> so the best part was just all the transmitters all had the original frequencies in them. You now the transmitter engineers, our transmitter engineers, you know, just flip the switch back to the original frequencies. I make it sound easy. It wasn't quite that easy, but it was almost that easy. And Ray Smith, who sent that last message, the one that you saw on the printer, he sat down at the position he'd been in for so many years and sent the opening message for the new KPH. Now to us, that's big. Thank you. Okay, uh, John, uh, you're going to ask with a hand up, then we'll go over to the, to the uh, chat part. Go ahead, John. Oh, thanks. Hey, I just wanted to ask when, uh, when you guys get back into like full swing of inviting folks what's i mean what's that experience like for like the new ham or the ham that like would love to get their hand on a key is that something that can happen or you know, oh, absolutely absolutely yeah. can happen um and when special people like you uh come we give the special tour um and if you really want to make a day of it, you'll join us at the transmitter site in the morning for services of the church of the continuous wave, my friend. And we serve pastry from the bovine bakery, which is just the best that's ever been made. And plenty of coffee. And we all stand and sit around the table and we have RCA China and forks and spoons and all the rest of it. And uh, tall, tell big, tall radio tales before we go out on our uh, on our assigned jaws but that's usually not open to the public but of course for what we say true believers like everyone here is and you, you get to come there and see that and then follow us up to the receive site when we take control from the receive site to key the transmitters in Bolinas and at that point yeah you can sit down at uh, any of the positions we set you right up uh, if you have a commercial ticket, you can uh, sit the circuit at KPH. Uh, you don't even need a ticket to operate on the ham side and just sit down there and, uh, you know, we'll go, it's, it's a, quite a bit different from operating a ham transceiver, but we go, go over the whole thing. Not a big deal. You know, it's fixed frequency and all the rest of it, but okay. You know, if you don't have a key, we'll give you a key. If you don't have headphones, we'll give you a headphone uh, and away you go for, you know, and you're keying. Uh, a 1500 watt transmitter down in Bolinas attached to a, a pretty good size antenna. So you've got a little bit of authority on the air there. And then after that, 
if you have your license and you have a printout of it, we have a special stamp and you get endorsed on your license as an operator with the official seal of the MRHS for all the bragging rights that that gives you. <laughs> wow, that's cool. All right, uh, Barry, you want to take pick them up in the chat? Sure, Oscar had a question. Where do you get the economical support for your operations? Well, that is, of course, the question. And uh, this, is, uh, this is not an inexpensive operation. Well, first of all, we're not paying rent, right? The park service, uh, they, they, that's park service property, we're in there. Even more important, we're not paying the electrical bill. <laughs> the park service is paying that. But for the maintenance and the operations end of it, the vast majority uh, normally just comes from 10, 20, 15, $50, $100 donations from folks, from true believers. A big check will be a $500 check. And we are stingy. We are stingy. I mean, they, we just put that money in the bank and it just stays there. So now comes along a big uh, antenna, like that antenna restoration project I was showing you the pictures of. Well, that came from Park Service budget money. And it was, I think we got like 160,000, something like that. Tremendous amount of money, a drop in the bucket for what we actually needed to do. But we were able to contribute 40 or $50,000 to that because we had been so stingy and this bank account had built up over time. Uh, a lot of the stuff we just pay for out of our own pockets, parts and building and things like that. So that, that's basically how it works. Okay, Barry. That's it for the chat. That's it for the chat? No more hands up? Nope, not that I can see. This has been a great presentation there, Richard. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's been my great pleasure. I hope you can tell that. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it. Uh, I, I, I like your hat. I was a readyman in the Navy. And our, of course, we all wore the sparks. So that's when I saw your hat, that's the first thing I related to. Dan has his hand. The other Dan has his hand up. Okay, Dan, take it away. Uh, Richard, you captured me when you used the phrase historic fabric. I started my career in the Park Service doing preservation and adaptive re repurposing of historic structures. A um, long time ago before the internet got invented. Uh, so, And by the way, Sicily is now the superintendent here at Yosemite. I haven't heard anything bad about her, but I haven't heard anything good about her. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll hear something good about her from me. She's the best. Yeah, well, that's the kind of endorsement that very few superintendents ever get. That's right. And that's, that's really meaningful, especially for one that takes this position here. He'll either end up in, in uh, D.C. and the Park Service might get some, uh, how do I say it, nationwide good leadership, which we're a little short of. <laughs> well, she was uh, she was just wonderful during her tenure. Well, and uh, I, boy, I respect what you did majorly. And um, I, I, you know, the the secret about the Park Service is you don't spend your own budget. You do things that other people have to have done, and you use their money. And it sounds like this is a convenient and symbiotic relationship. So, kudos. Well, thank you so much. We can't believe that they that they like us. I mean. What do we, you know, they know about elk, they know about harbor seals, they know about plants, birds, animals. We don't know nothing about no plants and birds and animals. We know about radio. And yet, they, they not only tolerate us, but really seem to like us in the park. And it's still a, a matter that I still have yeah. a hard time getting my head around. The mission is to protect and preserve natural, historic, and cultural resources. And you qualified on two of them. Yeah, you're you're speaking you're speaking the language that we learned once we started dealing with actual museum. Well, folks. not imagine you're writing the grant stuff, boy. That's, <laughs> I, you did you did a, you got a whole lot done in what could have been an untenable environment that you turned to your advantage. We got super lucky, that's for sure. All right, do we have any more comments out there? Anybody got any more questions? Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, Richard, Richard very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very, very much. Really do appreciate this.
Well, ladies, gentlemen, I really have to tell you how much I, I appreciated the invitation and the privilege of being with you. Thank you so much. Very welcome. We hope to have you back. All right. With that, unless somebody's got something more to add or subtract or multiply here, I'm going to close the session out. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody. Bonsoir, mes amis.